Hey everyone, Rob from Southgate Media Group here. Before we get started with this podcast, we have a quick message. If this is your first time checking out the show, we love that you found us and we really hope you enjoy it. What we have to say is for the subscribers, if you enjoy our shows, would you please donate to help keep these going? We don't want to have to put traditional ads on these shows, but this does cost money. So we really do rely heavily on donations. To make a donation to the show, please go to our website, www.southgatemediagroup.com. Go to the page for the show, and in the upper right-hand corner is a donate button. It takes you right to PayPal, and you can donate whatever amount you want. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. And now, on with the show. Welcome to Gravel Scast. My name is Jonathan, and today I'm joined by Nikki. Hello. And today we have a guest, uh, Jason from the Wapa's Lair. Thanks for coming on, Jason. Oh, thanks for having me. Glad to be back. Sweet. Um, so we finally got to the, um, you know, we've been pretty busy lately. Glad we finally got to record and that we got to have a guest on. Um, so what were your initial thoughts about this episode, um, Jason? Oh my goodness. Um, I loved it. It was a great episode. Uh, intense episode, I think is, is probably the best word that I would use, uh, for my reaction for it. And of course we'll get more into detail as to what those is later, but I, I, I just initial thoughts intense, but, uh, I loved it. So I'm really glad rebels went where they did with this episode. <laughs> what about you, Nikki? I, I feel the same way. I was so glad to see that they went to this a little darker, this darker place uh, with this episode. And it was, I would like, I watched them again. I watched the first part of Empire Day and then I watched Gathering Forces back to back last night to rewatch them. And they just fit. It's such a great linear story. I mean, it works well in two parts, but it works even better if you watch them back to back. And yes. I just thought it was intense. It was dark. Um, I think it was probably one of the best episodes we've had of the show so far. Um, so I, I loved it. I thought I, you know, I've watched it several times. Agreed. How about yeah. you, Jonathan? Yeah, I agree. Just echoing what you guys said. I mean, this series has come a long way um, since we watched Spark Rebellion for, you know, 500 times. <laughs> you know, um, finally seeing this episode. Um, definitely looking forward to the next half of the season. But yeah, overall, a great episode. Um, hearing, hearing more about the Force and hearing more about this relationship between Ezra and Kanan. Um, right. So to start off, you know, we it's continued um, from that cliffhanger with Zebo and uh, Zebo and Ezra, and you know, we see that you know e, um, Zebo, you know, he got the uh, he got like the uh, the implants, you know, and we see that you know he was most likely he's been you know risking his life to break in. And to try to steal some of these secrets, you know? Um, right. He's, I mean, first he's like accidentally downloading, downloaded all this information into his Lobot esque headgear. <laughs> and then he's trying to do something good with it. And, um, but it's also affecting his, you know, his, the, his mentality. It's affecting how he acts and responds. And I think when you have that much information that's been like, forced into you, you that's probably the only way you can respond is by being a little nutty so and jason, disjointed jason what did you think of like you know in the in the previous episode you know we saw like you know all these like battle plans including the at at so what did you think of you know zebo's information he got and his whole like you know he's like speaking he's like talking gibberish and all sorts of other nonsense uh well it, it was interesting um it was something i didn't expect uh them to do just to have someone download a whole bunch of secrets and that the empire apparently uh, is has lax enough computer security that that would actually happen um but, but it was interesting that, that that it did happen and uh uh it made for uh to, to coin a to, to use a, another george lucas word it made a great MacGuffin mm -hmm. for for these two uh episodes um but one thing I did notice upon my last rewatch of the episode uh, and skipping ahead a bit is, is when finally uh, Ezra is able to forgive Sibo, um, 
and Zebo is able to get more control over his mind, mm-hmm. the the lights on the the implant stop flashing randomly, and they they turn off unless he's you know trying to access it deliberately. So that was a sort of really nice little, little subtle thing that they threw in there, and I and I didn't notice it the first couple times watching it, but just just watching it uh, last night, uh, I noticed that. So yeah, I noticed that too, and I think you're absolutely right. It was like finally uh, he's been forgiven. And he's able to kind of calm down a little bit, except mm. when like, he tries to access and then because he's got so much in there. And I think knowing what happened to Ezra's parents because of this implant was weighing on him a lot. And because of his relationship with the family. Um, and I did notice the, that he calmed down a lot after he finally was able to tell someone about what happened to Ezra's parents. I mean, I think it's interesting that, you know, it's like, and even like Hera and Sabine, they kind of point out, it's like, you know, he couldn't have really done thing events. Right. A bunch of, you know, imperial soldiers. I mean, it looks like um, Ziva, he's not really um, combat heavy. Right? No. No. You know? Plus, so, Ezra is an angry 15-year-old child. Yeah. I yes. mean, he's, he's, he reacted appropriately for his age, and um, he's got a lot of anger, and he's got a lot of uh, sorrow. And 15-year-old boys kind of lash out um, with instead of dealing with the anger. And once he really dealt with it, he was able to reach a, a, a calmer place in himself as well, which is why, you know, he was able to do what he did at the at the end. <laughs> but I think he I think it was absolutely an appropriate response for him to have is to re, to lash out at everybody. Um, and I think they were very I think the, the writers were very cognizant of that. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. It, it's a it's a traumatic uh, incident that has basically shaped the way his life has gone ever since. Um, right. And it's it's a raw spot for him. And so anything that sort of brings that up, brings it to the forefront of anything he's going to lash out at. So, yeah, uh, you know, Zebo exactly. just got the brunt of 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 everything that's been building for the last set, you know, eight years or so. Um, right. whether he deserved it or not. So. It was the kill the messenger kind of thing. <laughs> and we'd see yeah. Zebo was almost like, you know, this whole time he's like struggling to kind of get through this gibberish and all this stuff, and he's just like trying to kind of, you know, express himself how sorry he is, and that, you know, most likely, as this was happening, he, he was just basically helpless, you know, but right. he is able to help, including like, he kind of has this knowledge just to fix the hyperdrive, you know, he just kind of walks along and just boom, 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 boom <laughs> and then they speed off, you know, it's just like, what right. are you doing, Zebo? I think, <laughs> along, you know, with all that stuff in his brain, it's like they, they say if we were able to access more than 10% of our, our brain, we would probably go a little mad. Um, I think he just was overwhelmed by emotion and all this information. He didn't know how to deal with it. And when he finally was able to focus, he was able to fix the hyperdrive. He was able to explain to Hera at least what had happened. And, uh, you know, he was forgiven. And I think that forgiveness uh, from Ezra really made the difference for him. I think in being able to kind of relax and Mm -hmm. not be so frantic. It, it helps stabilize him. Oh, definitely. Yeah, so. that was the word I was looking for. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. I mean, I think you know because when he was upset at the beginning, you know, it's like you know, there was no way because you know, at the, you know, he was kind of lashing out. Like you said, he's a fifteen year old, and he's like, you know, I'll never forgive you, you know, you know. And Zevo's just kind of like, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, I couldn't do anything, you know. And of course. You know, we can see that Ezra, even when Hera and Sabine, they would kind of explain what happened. It's like Ezra, you know, for these past, like, eight years or something, or since he was eight, he's been on his own. So it's right. almost like, you know, I'm just kind of moving on. They were gone. You messed up. I'm just kind of just want to go forward. He doesn't want to deal with the past. Right. And I think it's, I mean, his parents being taken made him who he is, and it's, uh, like his survival skills would not be where they are. He probably wouldn't be able to access the forces readily. Um, so I think he's come to this place where he's just like, these things happened in my life and I have to stop blaming things I had no control over. Thing I can't blame Zebo anymore because he really had no control over what happened. This was going to happen whether he was there or whether he could do anything or not. You know, he could have gotten killed if he had tried to, to stop it. 
and then we wouldn't have all this information. I think that, you know, he's he's becoming more mature as he's uh, getting more uh, connected to the force. And I think he's realizing that it's not all about him and that he has to let go of this anger or else it will consume him. Right. It was a great Jedi morality tale. Indeed. And Kanan, I don't know if he expected that to happen or not, but he's all about trying to clear, you know, his mind so he can be more successful. So, Mm -hmm. um, so Jason, what did you think about, uh, the inquisitors, um, tie fighter and his helmet and his kind of, um, you know, two side tie fighters kind of reminiscent (laughs) of Vader. Oh yeah. No, I mean, it, it definitely is. And it's a, it's a precursor to what Vader gets. Um, Obviously, without the hyperdrive, because he's back on board the Star Destroyer. Um, but I thought it was cool. Um, I mean, I've never been particularly uh, enthusiastic about the TIE Fighter design to begin with. It's just sort of, you know, Star Wars and there mm-hmm. yeah. for me. X-Wings, on the other hand, I'm, I'm super excited about. But <laughs> uh, we don't have those in Rebels yet. Um, so TIE Fighters, I mean, it was cool. Um, it was nice and fancy because it had the tracking missile. Um, and the fold up wings and, and all that stuff. Um, yeah, no, it, it was cool. Uh, I don't really have anything other to say. Yeah. I mean, cool. I think it's cool that, you know, just from th- throughout the, the season, you know, we have these, all these callbacks, most notably the use of these, the gun turrets, you know, and that, you know, Sabine and Kanan get in and just like, you know, trying to just like Han and Luke, which I think is really cool. Oh yeah, no, that's it's a great callback, and you know, but it's 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 different enough to um, establish the ghost on its own because while the ghost is obviously meant to to be reminiscent of the Millennium Falcon and the way it's used and uh, you know the the way it does things and kind of the way it looks, um, it's definitely getting established as its own ship, as its own personality within the Star Wars universe. Um, and it is one of the, I don't want to say one of the few things, but it's one of the, the biggest things I think that is um, really, I think establishing itself beyond just rebels as something that really fits in Star Wars. So yeah, totally is the ghost. Agree. So and I love that it has you know, like a smaller ship, you know, it has a, uh, Yes. The Phantom, uh, the, and it can d- detach and be its own thing. And I thought that was a really interesting um, design for a ship because we've never really seen that before in a Star Wars uh, vehicle. And I totally agree with you. It, it is one of those things it, that the, the ghost is one of those things that will stand out the most as as part of Star Wars canon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, another thing, you know, so like you said, the tracker, the little tracker mm-hmm. missile, um, that was definitely cool. Um, you know, <laughs> and, it's, and it's also a, often a thing we see in trackers, whether it be um, Obi-Wan and Attack of the Clones just throwing one at him or um, or like in the Fa- or the Falcon, like in A New Hope. You know, they put it. We're not quite sure where it is on the tracking, but the whole thing where it's like, you know, let him get away. But it's really a trap, you know, and in mm-hmm. here, you know. They make um, the Inquisitor, you know, he makes him think like he's got away. But, you know, just in case, you know, um, one to kind of a little insurance and he takes the bait. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Inquisitor is is very smart. I mean, he is not a stupid villain. No. Um, he is, I think, wiser than most villains that we've seen in the Star Wars universe um, because he he is aware of traps, you know, not to, you know. Harken back to uh, Admiral oh, Akbar. <laughs> <laughs> it's a trap. Um, but he's uh, he's he's right there, and he will he takes risks, and he's cunning and devious, and he he thinks things through very very thoroughly. Like when he showed up on the asteroid base, and he was like. Yeah, we yeah, this is a trap. <laughs> he walks in and it's like he knows what's going on. Oh, you oh, thought your yeah. kitty cats were gonna, were going to protect you basically. <laughs> and I was like then I don't think Ezra and Kanan were expecting his level of awareness and it's like this guy could use the force. Don't mess with the inquisitor. I mean, he's 
He's he's right up there. He's I mean, more episodes like that, he's gonna be up there with the ranks of Darth Vader. So Yeah. I, it's it's interesting, um, to me. The the Inquisitor is definitely um more than a match for the crew of the ghost, it seems. Oh, yeah. Um and he seems like he would be able to take them out, you know, at any minute. And it's only by the skin of their teeth that the crew of the ghost is able to escape and, and live to fight another day with this guy. And so, you know, every time he shows up in the vicinity of them, you get nervous because he he just gives off this this air of, of complete control and mm-hmm. deadly skill. And oh, yeah. It's, you know, and you saw it when he was dueling. And while Kanan wasn't, you know, as caught off guard as he was back in Rise of the Old Masters, he did better. Um, he still wasn't a match uh, in lightsaber combat to the Inquisitor by far. Um, right. But he's he's a terrifying villain for this crew because while the crew is is good and they work well together it's not like han luke and leia who's are you know the big three and can take on the empire single-handedly almost (laughs) um you know so uh they they got to watch out for this guy and he's he's always ups the ante whenever he shows up yeah it's it's never a oh how are they going to get away from him this time it's always oh my god is he gonna is is this the day he's going to catch them right because you don't know because he could catch them. I mean, he's that good. I mean, it's only really for by luck or something else, you know, outside their control usually that they get, they're able to get away. And that's one of the things I love about the Inquisitor is that he is like almost he's better than they are at all of this stuff, and he knows it and they know it, but yet he's they still manage to. But like you said, by the skin of their teeth, just like get out of there really fast before you can jump. And I think he's going to be a very formidable. I mean, he already is a formidable opponent, but I think as he becomes more focused on the crew of the ghost, because he's got all this other stuff going on. But one, I think he's really starting to focus more on this crew and saying, I have to bring these people down because they're just a little too slippery for me. And for my for my personal taste, <laughs> it's like I'd rather they were dead. <laughs> Agreed. But I have to keep I have to catch them. And this thing happened, and they got away. And this thing happened, and it's like I need better stormtroopers with me, please. Um, <laughs> he's just such a great, well-rounded bad guy. He's not just he's not like maniacally evil. He's not like twirling his mustache and steepling his fingers, going ha ha ha, excellent. He's <laughs> You know, he's not Mr. Burns, um, but he you know what he's after. You know why he's after it. He is single focused and he will do whatever he has to do. And he does it with style and he does it with this a level of skill that I haven't seen like since Yoda took on Dooku. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, that and I had I watched it over and over again, that lightsaber duel. And I was like, yay, a lightsaber duel. Um <laughs> And it was like when he threw the double-sided lightsaber and the spin that thing had on it, <laughs> it was like so beautiful. I was just like, oh, that is, I just like melted. I was like, oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> that was just so perfect. I've never seen a lightsaber do that. And it was just, he's just so cool. And I find myself sometimes going, maybe he should catch them. <laughs> Maybe I'm maybe I've gone to the dark side because I really love this character. Uh, my my only thing with him is that I hope this you know as he's running after them to try and get them as they're just about to escape and he throws the lightsaber and Kanan knocks it away. I hope that doesn't become like a running gag because we've seen it twice now. Yeah, no, uh, I, I totally agree. I think um, they, that has to stop like right now. Yeah, uh, you know, you can bring it up once or twice, you know, every now and then, but don't do not do it every time they face off, because uh, that happened during Rise of the Old Masters, and it happened again this time. Mm-hmm. And so, I'm like, I mean, it, it made it made to. sense, but but we have to watch the amount of times that that happens, because otherwise it's going to be, and I would have gotten them if it hadn't been for the fact <laughs> that he hit my lightsaber away, you know? Yeah, with that spinning lightsaber, the only way you were going to stop it was to, to knock it off, knock it away with your lightsaber. I mean, that was really the only way to stop that. 
But yeah, I totally agree with you. They can't, you, if they do that again, it has to be several episodes in, away. And I, and the, I was just thinking about Kanan, you know, Kanan hasn't had that many opportunities to have a lightsaber duel in the last few years. <laughs> um, because really there's no one else that he could really have a lightsaber duel with, um, since rise of the old masters. Um, so some people were complaining to me, Oh yeah, he wasn't very good. Like, what do you expect? Who's he got to fight with? Right. Who's he have to practice with? He's got like, as far as he knows, he's got the only lightsaber left in the galaxy. Um, so it's not like he can fight himself or give Chopper a lightsaber and uh, try to <laughs> train with him. So He'll I throw think balls at you. <laughs> yeah. I think he's. Oh my goodness. I think I, he's, I got now, this mental just... picture of Chopper with a lightsaber in each hand, just like. <laughs> You know, wheeling away at somebody. Oh my gosh, I would love to see around. that. Oh god, oh. now I have to see that. Dave Filoni, please make this happen. I think one told thing that you know we haven't seen, and the crew of the Ghost was like, "Are you really going to try this?" Is trying to drop out of hyperspace in an escape pod, you know, while still in hyperspace. I thought that was pretty. Yeah, pretty. It, it uh, was pretty beastly. Pretty uh, crazy. <laughs> It was something that I've, you know, as a science geek who doesn't really understand science, but just loves it. Um, I was like, how would that ever be possible? And it kind of reminded me of this scene in Finding Nemo <laughs> where oh, yes. they're in the, the East Australian current and they have to <laughs> they have to get out of it while they're still in that flow. And I was like, oh, my God. Well, if if Dory and and Marlin could get out of the EAC, is it possible for <laughs> the phantom to get out of hyperspace because it's just going so fast and the and the effects they use like to see how it was physically affecting Kanan and, and Ezra and I just thought th- the animation in that sequence was so beautiful that I was like oh okay they did it <laughs> yay <laughs> it yeah. worked it worked crush was right <laughs> <laughs> it can't happen I just oh, it was just a beautifully animated sequence and I look forward to more stuff like that and kind of breaking, you know, breaking up our concept of what's possible in Star Wars. Yeah. It's obviously not recommended. Um, no. <laughs> but That's something uh, I, want to, I want to personally do. No. Yes, yeah, so I but, can see uh, like a little mesh is going on. If hyperspace hyper travels ever achieve, do not attempt this. <laughs> right. yeah. don't Do try, try this, this at home kids <laughs> if you have a sh- if you have a spaceship please don't try this exactly but yeah no it, it was it made sense to me um mm-hmm. that that it would uh you know fall out of hyperspace and slow down and stuff but i mean the way like you said nikki the way that they they animated that was really cool and um you know when it got all not quite rainbowy yeah, but sort of rainbowy. Uh, I was like, oh, that. I guess that really makes sense. You know, um, for some reason that made sense to me. I don't know. Yeah. Why no, I it think did, like the distortion, it... the physical impact of going through something that's going that fast mm-hmm. and, and slowing down at the same time. Down. Exactly. It, it, it and breaking through the kind of the energy. Um, that hyperspace puts you through. I think it w- I was like that. That's what I imagine it would be like. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's not as controlled as just strictly being in hyperspace. Right, right. And you have to go through that. Yeah, I didn't know what to expect when they were going to do it, but then mm-hmm. when I saw it, I was like, well, that makes sense. Exactly. So uh, that's what I thought too. And it was just so cool looking. I was <laughs> like, oh, is this going to make them taller? Is this going to make them? You know, <laughs> Has time slowed now? Are they, you know, are they back into regular time? And they didn't recover quickly. It took time because nobody had ever done this. And it was realistically like, oh, my God, now we're out. What do we do? You know, how do we stop and I think this it's some, And I think it's something the Inquisitor did not see coming. No, I, I don't think even with his knowledge of the Force, I, I don't think he, he saw that. Because, I mean, like us, he only knows the boundaries of the science of, of Star Wars we've never seen that before. We've never even thought that that was a possibility. And he's like, Oh, well that was different. Oh, we just have a shuttle. It's not the whole ship. (laughs) This is weird. And I do love the, the tracking beacon. I thought that was really cool looking. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And Kanan was just like, pull it off through it, you know, destroyed (laughs) it. It was like, "Eh." so, um, 
So what did you guys think of the uh, fire mo- the uh, fire Mox? The 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 fear Nox? I think they're called fear Nox. Oh, I think I think <sighs> it's been a while they since both, I've looked at it. Yeah, they both sound right. Anyways, <laughs> potato potato. Uh, right. Um, I I like them. They're I when I first saw them a couple episodes ago, I wasn't sure what to make of them. I was like, that's interesting. <laughs> um, they didn't seem out of place to me. But I didn't quite, I couldn't quite figure out what to think about them. Um, but now that I've, you know, seen them in action more, um, they definitely feel Star Wars animated. Um, if they feel like they fit in that world, uh, in the Star Wars animation world. Um, but, uh, they're very much more, more cat slash bat like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got that. Uh, you know, and I got that more this time around than I did. Uh, a couple episodes ago when Hera and Sabine encountered them. Um, I really got the concept of them more this time, which uh, because we spend more time just sort of looking at them without them running around past the screen, you know, they were sitting still and, you know, moving slowly at times. So I got a better look at them this time. So maybe that was all it took for me, but um, I, I, I grasped the concept of them better this time. And, um, I did not know how big they got. And <laughs> when I saw the big one, I was like, I don't think that's supposed to happen. Uh, <laughs> and mama's, mama's not happy. That was one angry cat. <laughs> no kidding. Oh, uh, my God. Yeah, I thought I agree with you. I thought they fit in really well with the um, with the animated world of Star Wars, even going back to like the droids and the Ewoks uh, animation uh, animated series when I was a kid. Um, they looked really cool, very sleek. Um, I loved when they were calm. I just thought, oh, cause we'd seen what they could do. And to me, there's nothing scarier than seeing the knowing what that thing can do and seeing it sitting calmly, mm-hmm. like it's waiting. And it's like, I was like, oh my God, the Inquisitor's not going to do these, the one little things. Okay. You know what they remind me of? And I was trying to figure this out for the longest time time but now i finally did it remind me of toothless from how to train your dragon <laughs> yes oh, yes yes and i love toothless is my favorite dragon so i have to, i that's maybe why i was drawn to them i was like oh i want one <laughs> i did it was like in the episode i don't know was it the last the, the episode the empire day or the one before that where he had where they had to tame that kitty cat in the in the re- I was like, I want one. It was so cute. And I see these things sitting all calm and almost like purring while Kanan and Ezra are sitting there kind of meditating. I'm like, oh, now they're cute. And they're right. They do look like tooth. They do harken back to toothless. Um, it's, like, it's like a dragon cat. Exactly. It, if we could make those, I would be perfect. Um, <laughs> and then at, then you see, you know, the mama cat, uh, show up and you know mamas don't like when their babies are in danger but knowing they could get that big <laughs> was really <laughs> scary i was like oh my god how many more are down there because <laughs> it just kind of came up out of nowhere right behind ezra and it was like oh is there an elevator under it or is it that big this you know, this is like is that pit? <laughs> <laughs> this is like the alligator in the sewer that somebody flushed down the toilet because he got too big <laughs> yes, um exactly. <laughs> and then it comes up behind you. Uh, never that alligator we 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 splashed out. It's back. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I uh, thought I thought they were great, and I love that they kind of the name kind of sounds like Minoc because that's <laughs> such a like, and they kind of have the batty thing going on like the Minocs did. Um, because I love when they kind of connect things to the original trilogy. So. I thought it was just such a great scene, and I was sad when they t- some of them died. So I think they're doing a really good job over there at the writing and animation. <laughs> it's like, you've made us love these ferocious bat cats. <laughs> I think I think it's interesting <clears throat> excuse me, um, that, you know, Kanan is constantly telling Ezra to, like, slow down, clear your thoughts, and here we see an example of where Ezra really can't, you know, he's trying to calm them, just like we saw in the other episode, trying to calm the uh, the little cat. He's trying to, like, calm them, but he really just cannot, you know, he's scared of them, you know? Mm-hmm. And, of course, if you're scared, they're going to be scared. Or they're going to sense that you're weak and pounce. 
but I think that once Kanan jumped in, I think it was a little easier for Ezra to harness um, that stillness within him and to let go, which is something that all Jedi need to do. And yeah. I think, I think, and I made notes about that. I think in this episode, Ezra uh, learned more about what a Jedi is and what a Jedi does than in any other episode where Kanan's tried to train him. I think like Kanan said, it's like, this is the best, te- you know, if you can do this, you know, while you're trying to survive, you can harness that. That's what a Jedi is about. It's about being put into these situations, being able to focus. And he said, you know, do what you do best. You survive. And it's like learning as you're going kind of thing, learning right. as you're thrown into the, to the melee. And I think I, I, it stuck out to me as I was making notes. It was like, he really became a Padawan on that episode. He, yeah. he, he finally got it. I don't know if he's aware of that he got it, but I think he's aware now that he has a potential that Kanan sees in him. And I'm really intrigued as to why Kanan needs to talk to Hera. <laughs> like you said. Well, the- <laughs> well, he needs to talk to Hera because of um, of what Ezra does later, you know, when yeah. he drew on the dark side. And that's yeah. that's the that's- issue. We got to... Yeah. We gotta, Let everybody we gotta, know about this. <laughs> yeah, we have to do something to stop this, yeah. to make sure that he doesn't go to that dark place. But I think, like with Luke and with Anakin, you know, that's one of the things that a young Jedi has to overcome is the dark side, is the lure of the dark side. And like Yoda says, fear leads to anger, and anger leads to hate, hate leads to suffering. And once you can control that, then you know you've achieved something. Then you know that you have become a Jedi. Um, so I, it's something that worried me because I could feel that he, that's what Ezra was using. He was using his fear and his anger to bring that mama, mama bat cat um, out to play. Um, but it was also kind of playing into the hands of the Inquisitor a little bit. Yeah. Because and the, he that. the other uh side of that that was making me concerned for Ezra's sake um, is Ezra doesn't know really about the dark side. I mean, he heard the Inquisitor mention it. I think he mentioned it in back in Rise of the Old Masters, but yeah. Kanan hasn't been teaching him about it. Kanan's been, you know, trying to get the basics in him and, you mm-hmm. know, focus on being a Jedi rather than, you know, saying, but this is what you have to look out for. Um, and Which so, I think is a mistake. Right. And Kanan admits that. Um, but Ezra, you know, when things get tough and he's cornered, he goes immediately and draws on that instinctively because that's sort of where his mindset lives, you know, from when he was surviving before he met the crew of the ghost. And he he really grabbed it in a big way this time. And it was... I, it was a little scary for him. Yeah. You know, I was a little scared for him. Yeah. Um, I think he, he saw, he felt unnatural. I think it felt wrong to him, mm-hmm. like to go as dark as oh. he obviously did. Um, and I think you're right. I think uh, it's not something that Kanan has, has emphasized or talked about in his training is how to cope with the dark side, how to cope with your anger. He's always talking about quieting his mind which is in a way is talking about like getting rid of anger. But I think even in episode one, Qui-Gon warns a little Anakin about that, about the dark side. And I think it's something that Kanan needs to talk about with him. It's part of the training. It's they go hand in hand, the light side and the dark side. You can't, you know, they go hand in hand and there's such a fine line between that. You have to, that a Padawan has to know the dangers and I think Kanan might be realizing maybe he's not the best uh, master because he never was a master. He was a kid when this all went down in oh. episode three. Mm-hmm. So he doesn't really have a whole lot of, you know, resources to back him up or he doesn't have a whole lot of training um, behind him to be able to adequately train Ezra. I think he's right. maybe coming to terms with that, too, is that he's not helping much he's not really a he's not really training him and i think maybe he needs to really focus more on the training well kanan's learning as ezra's learning exactly kanan's learning how to be a master because he's never had that responsibility before kanan's learning how to teach while ezra's learning how to be a jedi um 
and so it's it's it is one of those interesting situations um where you know hindsight is always 2020 and you know as they're flying away to meet back up with the ghost you know kanan tells ezra you know i haven't been teaching you what i need to teach you right i Um, think that showed that that experience with the inquisitor really kind of hit it home for kanan and the interesting thing about that whole experience is um According to Ezra, he doesn't remember it. He just knows it felt wrong Mm -hmm. and cold. And I'm wondering if maybe farther down the road he will remember it, but won't tell uh, Kanan that he does. Right. Or he he doesn't want to remember it because of how it made him feel afterwards. Right. It could be a mental block he's got. Which is, you know, kind of a good thing in a sense because he doesn't remember how he access that part of the force but it's also not a good thing because that's a jedi has to be completely aware of their actions so yeah you can't use your anger right you know to push someone away you know i think it's interesting that you know um, ezra he was scared of these creatures but he was really kind of having the um remembering about Zebo and about losing his parents and finding mm-hmm. out the truth. It's all about fear, like we've been talking about in the last mm-hmm. bit. Um, yeah, and I think him forgiving and understanding Zebo and why Zebo couldn't do anything to say to help his parents. I think letting that anger go, it was it freed both Zebo and um, Ezra up a lot. It freed a lot of their emotions up. And as a Jedi, you cannot be emotional. At, to that extent, I mean, he was holding on to it, and that's one of the things you have to get rid of <clears throat> is these attachments to the past, and not just like physical attachment, but emotional attachment and mental attachment to the negatives. I mean, you could be, I mean, Jedi access their emotions all the time, but they're not, they don't cling to them. And that's what Ezra was doing. He was clinging to anger, he was clinging to fear and sadness. And I think when he was able to let that go, he really became more introspective and kind of focused. He, he went inward rather than lashing out, which I, I, I thought was a great change for him. So um, there is, you know, a bit about Fulcrum. So, Jason, what are your thoughts about Fulcrum, you know, as a character, like who he could be, who he, she could be? What do you think? Oh, man. Um, well, first of all, I don't think it's Bail Organa. Um, I know that's one of the the common suspicions out there. Right. Um, because, uh, because of the ship. Well, like, yeah, because yeah. of the ship. And, and I'm trying to remember, I think the ship Bail Organa had in droids in distress had red markings on it or different markings on it. Um, but I'd have to go back and look. I haven't had a chance to do that. Um, I think an easy answer uh, could be Senator Gail Travis. The guy who keeps breaking in on the hollow transmissions. Um, I think that could be an easy place to go with it. Um, but I don't think it would be the most interesting. Um, I would rather see somebody. I don't know. Someone new. Someone. I don't know if someone new. Um, one of the other suspicions I had was that it could be um, Cham Sandula, who is Hera's uncle. Right. And was in the Clone Wars. Uh, that was one of the thoughts I had early on, but now I'm not so sure. And I've heard a lot of theories going around that it might be Ahsoka. Um, oh, yes. I haven't heard that one. Yeah, I heard uh, anyone on a podcast. I heard them putting the voice through a like a voice, um, you know, mixer or something, and they got like Ahsoka's voice out of it. Um, but that could have just been kind of like sometimes you kind of are pulling at straws and you think right. you're hearing something. Uh, but yeah, it's right. very possible. You always, your brain kind of tries to go to the most likely or something familiar. And I think mm-hmm. having him think Ahsoka is very natural. Um, I do think it's interesting that Hera doesn't let anyone else meet Fulcrum. Mm-hmm. And that to me says it might be, you know, a member of her family or maybe it is Ahsoka. Now that I'm aware of this rumor, um, maybe it is. Maybe it's something that they're not supposed to know. Um, uh, while I think Ahsoka will show up in the series at some point, um, I think they would wait until season two just to let 
um, the new characters get established. Right. I totally um, agree. Before bringing in uh, such a huge fan favorite character like Ahsoka into the show. Um, one other thought I heard, I heard out there was that it could be, uh, Lux Bonteri, who of course, um, Ahsoka had feelings for back in the Clone Wars. Um, he's the separatist, uh, senator's kid, uh, uh, that um, his mother was murdered, and then he became uh, the the rebel leader on Onderon back in the Clone Wars. Um, and so that was that was another uh, you know already established character that I heard a theory for. So personally, I don't know. There's a lot of theories out there. Um, I I think it would be interesting if uh, it was Rex, um, Captain Rex, but. Uh, I would love that personally. Um, I'm, I'd love that character so much. Old Rex. Old Rex. It, it breaks my heart yes. to think that he, at, with Order, uh, when they executed the Order and sixty six and the the clones. Hey turned. Jason, can you do a uh, execute Order sixty <laughs> six? Execute Order sixty six. Oh, oh my God, creepy. Okay, go. just got chills. <laughs> Um, I, part of me, because I love that character so much. And a lot of it is when I introduced the show to my nephew when he was about three, um, he really loves Rex. He is such, he, he's nine now and he still his favorite star Wars character and he's seen everything. Um, and so part of me is like, for my nephew's sake, I don't want Rex to have been one of those clones who went bad. So part of me wants him to have something happen to him in the Clone Wars, um, so that he wouldn't go bad. Um, but I would also, and maybe it's, you know, if Echo had survived, um, he was my other favorite clone. I, I could see him as Fulcrum too, but, um, I would not mind if it was Rex, if something happened and he didn't go bad. Uh, but he'd also be pretty old because they age, the clones age at, was it three times the normal rate? It's twice. Twice. It's twice the normal twice. age. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, he'd be pretty old by now. But I, I don't have anyone. Do it. <laughs> I don't have any one solid idea of who this could be. I'm just excited to find out, and yeah. um, I might have been the first one to put Rex out there um, as as Fulcrum. I don't know. I don't know if I've heard that no, theory. Out I there haven't before. heard it before. But you know, just, just another character to throw out there to muddy the waters even more. So you know, <laughs> an older Rex who's you know joined the the rebels and because maybe something misfired and he his goodness overcame the programming. I don't know. And is and is most likely his now that his age, you know, most likely his features are indistinguishable from a from a clone that you know is walking around. Right, I think most of the clones by now are probably out of service. I mean, I think um, Vader's they're... Vader's fist, the five of first. I think <laughs> that's like one of the last um, legions of storm tro- of clone troopers, right? Uh, um, I, they, no. I think they get switched over to regular storm troopers, but they're an elite group of storm troopers. Yeah, it's just a um, division of it's just Vader's personal group of storm troopers. Um, which is what the Vader's fist is. It's just the personal, uh, his chosen a little battalion, yeah. his chosen garrison as a member of that group. I'm, you know, very proud to be a part of that, to be <laughs> a member of Vader's fist. Um, even though I'm not a stormtrooper. Um, but I think after the clones kind of age out of active duty, I think I really think it becomes like the police force and you just recruit from everywhere. I think a lot of kids probably are drafted into like the Imperial Navy or the Imperial uh, 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 Cal- Calvary uh, Cavalry. Um, so I don't think at this time, I don't think we have many clones left because they'd be too old. Um, Fair enough. I, I think that we're dealing with because we've noticed some of them are not quite bright <laughs> and um which not just and we notice in the original trilogy that not all the the stormtroopers are very smart either um and nobody can shoot well they can shoot they just can't hit anything um but i think that by the time we get to rebels i really think that we're dealing with uh recruits from just anywhere and i think we're dealing with uh 
uh, drafted, you know, forces who are drafted yeah. into service. And and remember, we're 14, 15 years after Revenge of the Sith at this point, which is 28 to 30 years for clones. Um, and who and were so, already in their 20s and right. 30s. Right. So, so we're talking, you don't want 50, 60 year old troops out there. No, no, uh, there. It would explain the inability to hit anything, though. <laughs> yes. If there are any clones still in service, it would be like tacticians and admirals, you know. Right. Um, but I, I would say that they're pretty well phased out by this point. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so what did you guys, so what did, in general, you know, we basically discussed the battle, but what did you guys think of Ezra controlling one of these things and to actually attack him? Inquisitor. I thought that was pretty cool, just to like, because um, we haven't really seen that in Star Wars. Someone like taking, you know, control of something and to attack another. And of course, the Inquisitor, he can do a lot, but he can. He was a little caught off guard by this thing jumping on him. And well, I, I think the off guard probably was because of Ezra, and he didn't expect that from that kid. Like he just thought, oh, there's this annoying kid who, oh look, he's gonna sick the kitty cat. Oh crap. <laughs> he's controlling this thing. Um, I think it probably will put Ezra in his crosshairs even more and maybe want him to join him as, you know, dark side. Cause he's obviously capable of using the dark side of the force. Um, so I think he's, I think he's become, you know, the tar a target for the inquisitor now. Yeah. No, it, it, um, it surprised me, you know, in an, you know, first of all, I was like, oh, wow, I did not realize he was that powerful, you know, not only to, uh, you know, drag this gigantic fear knock, you know, dragon cat bat thingy up from the bottom of the this pit to fight for him. But that at the same time, you know, he's such out of control with his force ability that all the little rocks and debris within the the area are are you know lifting up and rising and you know just because he's he's not in control of it he's you know of, of what he's doing he's you know got this big general thing that he wants he needs something to attack the inquisitor in order to save him and Kanan and that's what you know his rage drug up uh was right, this I giant think thing with a giant but, fat cat dragon Yes, um, and, you know, so I was first shocked that he was able to do that, and then, like, that's not good. <laughs> you know, that was my other thing. You know, that's not a good thing for him to be able to do uh, because of how dark mm -hmm. that went for him. Um, and obviously, Kanan recognized that, so... Yeah, I think it scared Kanan more more than the Inquisitor, but um, not as much as it scared Ezra. And I think that you're right with that. He wasn't able to just control the, the bat cat dragon. Um, he had it, all these other things were happening as a byproduct and he couldn't control that. And I think it showed his naivete and his lack of focus in a sense, because mm -hmm. you really should just focus on the one thing. And I think even uh, the fact that he was able to, to summon and control that beast for as long as he did it it definitely is opening up new possibilities for story and um for interactions with the the empire right i think it's interesting that it kind of kind of um takes me back to uh, i forget what episode it was i think it was um was it joy in the distress or maybe it was after that it was no it was um flight or fight um, when Ezra, when we first see him, um, when he first, when Zeb was in trouble, um, Ezra push, force pushed, um, Captain, uh, Agent, um, Callus? Agent Callus. Agent Callus. Was that the episode or my? That, that was Droids in Distress. Droids in yeah. Distress. Okay. My first, that was our first guess. Um, so that was kind of the first kind of hint and there Kanan is surprised and this kind of takes it to another level. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. of his 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 ability is slowly unraveling because oftentimes his abilities being shown are just like are the kind of abilities that like Chopper kind of makes fun of. <laughs> you know, like the ball, like not being able not being able to hit the ball. Yeah, and... or like hovering, or kind of like pretending like the the ball is, is hovering. Mm 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know you're a big fan of Chopper, Jason. I I am. Um, I was a huge fan of him going into it because he looked just great. But he's become a bit of a troublemaker. He is. And I'm like, Chopper, you're so great, but just tone it down a little bit, he, please. He's like, he's like R2 times 10 in the uh, mischievous uh he, yeah, I have in my notes when you see Chopper all. It's like, no, Chopper! Right, right. So and although I, I, like, I like the way... Was... Ch- yeah. <laughs> I, I like the way Chopper was used in these two episodes um, where it was, you know, much more supportive and, and you know, doing everything with the, the mission in mind rather than just causing havoc for the, the right. sheer pleasure of it. Um I also like that they didn't rely on him. They couldn't rely on him as much because it's like, okay, Chopper, do this. Chopper, fix this. And it's like, um, you can't really do that. So they really had to come together as a team and figure out because they couldn't use Chopper. And they had to be Chopper, would do what Chopper would do for them. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think we can wrap, getting, you know, starting to wrap this up. Um, you know, they kind of, they get back to the ghost after all this happened and, you know, I know there's these different times where the crew of the ghosts, they kind of have their time where they, you know, we saw Zeb kind of, you know, not wanting to talk to anyone and just like going into mm-hmm. the room and kind of like wanting to be alone. And kind of a similar situation happens here. And, um, you know, and like we mentioned earlier before, you know, Kanan, you know, he wants to talk to Hera, you know, Sabine and Hera, they want to talk to Ezra. So um, the episode kind of has a general kind of, um, opposed to last episode, which was a cliffhanger, this was a, a little more wrapped up. Right. We just have some questions and, you know, finding out what happened to Ezra's parents. And I think the fact that Sabine and Hera are so protective of him now, um, and well, Hera always has been, but Sabine now is even more protective of Ezra than I think even Hera is and yeah. really wants him to be happy and wants him to find his place in which he gave him that hollow with the picture of his parents. Yeah, that was very it, touching. It, it was. It's his birthday. Yeah, because Empire Day is his birthday. And it just, it really was very sweet of her. And I think we're seeing a different side to her character that I really like. Right. My my only question is now that uh, Kanan was going to let, you know, is letting Ezra have his time by himself. Um, you know, so he stopped Hera from telling Ezra what Zebo told her mm-hmm. um, about Ezra's parents. My only question now is how long before we find out? Because Hera is very good at keeping secrets, as we've, we've mm-hmm. found out. And so how long is she going to, to sit on that information? Because, you know, obviously he's going through a lot right now and he doesn't need the distraction of finding out, you know, whatever this information is. Um, and, you know, is she going to try and wait for the right time, you know? Mm-hmm. And then what if it comes at a, a time where he absolutely, you know, what if he runs into his parents before she tells him about it? And right. then he's going to get mad that she didn't tell him, you know, that sort of thing. I, right. I'm wondering if that's going to come back. Either are we going to find out next episode when they come back in January, or are we not going to find out until down the road? That's my biggest question out of this. Right. So. Yeah. Will she defer to Kanan? Like, will she tell him? And then he says, we can't tell him this because ABC. Um, we will tell him when he needs to know when it's not too much of a, like, distraction to his training. Um, so yeah, I had that question too. It was, you know, when are they, when are we going to find out what happened to the parents? When are we going to find out? I mean, we could find out before Ezra finds out. That's true. Uh, uh, so they might do that, but I really kind of think it should be a question that is kind of lingering for a while. I think maybe season two even, but, or the end of season one, because Ezra needs time to stop being a pouty little brat. (laughs) <laughs> and which he kind of stopped at the end of this episode. He, was, he kind of was more focused, but I think he, he might not be ready to hear because it would probably change his whole view of his childhood and what he's doing and what he's done. And uh, it might be just too much. And I think that Hera will defer to Kanan on that. Great. So yeah. um, wrapping. Oh, were you going to say something else? No, I was just going to agree. And like, I, I think, I think that will end up, being saved i think the likelihood of that being saved for farther down the road rather than coming right back and answering that question is more likely so 
because it's like we want which, stuff to take us into season two and possibly right, season which, three. And, which drives me nuts because I want to know what the heck is going on. But, right, it but does storytelling, make more, wa- storytelling wise, you're right. It makes more sense. It makes so much more sense to wait. Ah, oh, which drives me nuts. But so, anyways, yeah. so what are you? So I, I guess kind of wrapping this up. What are your final thoughts on this? Either you know this episode and this part of the season as a whole going into the second half. What are your thoughts, Jason? Um, the episode was great. It, it definitely kicked things up a notch as far as Rebels is concerned. I've enjoyed Rebels. I, I've liked the more lighthearted episodes. I've really liked episodes like um, the Old Masters, where we started to delve into you know what's going on with the Inquisitor and the Force and stuff like that. But this. You know, the season's been pretty good so far, but this just kicked things up a notch. And I'm really interested to see if they're able to keep this up for the rest of the season and then where they go after the season is done. It definitely it definitely left us on a really good note, in my opinion, for uh, the last half of the season. And it sets a whole bunch of things up for what we could get for a great season finale. Um and, you know, like any good TV show or any good story, it answers some questions, but leaves us with even more. So, um, what about you? Um, I really, this was probably my favorite episode of the season so far. Um, I totally agree with Jason. I think that um, it's really setting us up for, you know, what wants to come and uh, we don't know what's to come. And yet we're very intrigued. I think it's. Uh, I just, this whole, this first half of the season has been way better than I expected it to be. I thought it might ter- start out really slowly and then kick up a, kick up like big cliffhanger season one at the end of season one. And I think that they've maintained such a great clip of pace, um, that it's become even better than I expected. I knew I was going to like it, but I didn't know I was going to like it this much. Um, and as for this episode, you know, the Inquisitor just rocks the dark side with, and that lightsaber duel just made my week when that aired. I was like, Oh my <laughs> God, that is the coolest thing ever. Cause he was so good. I mean, this is not someone that you want to go up against. And I love that they're making him more formidable. Like we're learning more and more about him and his abilities as we're learning about the crew, the ghost. Um, I like that we're getting more Sabine lately because I really was waiting for her story. Um, I'd like to, now I want more Zev uh, because he's kind of gone into the background a little bit. And I'm like, no, you're too big of a personality um, (laughs) to, uh, to do that. And so I just, I'm looking forward to the return of Rebels more than I, I actually anticipated the beginning of Rebels. I agree. I, Basically echoing what you guys say, I mean, great episode, um, literally Rebels is, you know, more more than what I expected. You know, I really had no idea what to expect, except a few characters. Um, but, you know, it's a whole new era of Star Wars, and we're speaking today on the 18th, and in one year, you know, episode 7 is coming, you know? Yeah. So, so much, Woo! like, like George Lucas would say, faster, more intense, and, you know... Aside from, you know, a few characters, you know, a character credit, you know, this is, we're basically in a post-Lucas time, and it's just a whole different, bringing in a whole different generation of Star Wars fans, and, you know, this could be, just this season could be the first exposure for some kids to Star Wars. So I think that's cool. Um, Looking more for more Zeb. Zeb and Chopper are my two favorites. Um, But yeah, overall, a great first half. I definitely look forward to them up in the ante in the next um, the next half, um, and it's you know, we don't have to wait a few months. We only have to, you know, first coming back in the first week. So um, right. All right. So I think that's that's it. Um, so Jason, where can people find you if you want to know what's going on? All right. Well, you can find me and Carl uh, at the Wampus Lair Podcast. Uh, that's facebookcom slash Lair Podcast. Uh, Twitter is at Wampus Lair. Um, and we are, of course, hosted on StarWarsReport.com with a whole bunch of other great podcasts over there. So, And, Nikki, where can they find us? They can find us on Twitter at Radio Free Indoor. And also go to our Facebook page, Facebook.com slash Radio Free Indoor. You can find Jonathan 
on Twitter at JEBell49er and me at iHeartColson. Cool. And, um, yeah, so just come like the Facebook page, interact with us, um, leave, us an, leave us an iTunes review, um, and listen to our other show. They'll both be coming out hopefully around the same time as we get closer and closer to the new year. Um, you know, and 2015 is just going to be huge. It's just going to be, it's just going to fly by. It's episode exactly. 7 and, you know, a new season of Rebels is going to be it's coming down the pipe. And everything's just boom, boom, boom. So, uh, so I think that's it. Um, I, think that's, I think that's all. For Jason, I'm Jonathan. I'm Nikki. Thanks for listening. Bye, guys. <laughs>